If you look at the picture, it is a picture of Old Faithful. Some of you, no doubt, um, have been out and have seen Old Faithful. Probably most of us, at least, have heard of it. It is a geyser, of course, located in Wyoming. It's in the Yellowstone National Park there. Amazingly, it's not the largest geyser that's in that park, uh, but it is the most well-known, and it is the one that erupts most frequently, and perhaps that is why it is the favorite. It's said that the eruptions can shoot some 3,700 to 8,400 U.S. gallons with each eruption. It can shoot water uh, as high as 185 feet, but the average is 145 feet. It also uh, can erupt anywhere from 45 minutes to 125 minutes apart, depending upon how long each eruption is. If the eruptions are short, uh, then they come more frequently. If they are longer, then uh, they are spaced more apart. But it is known as Old Faithful. Even though the eruptions cannot be predicted exactly, they can be predicted within about 10 minutes of when uh, they will occur. And yet that is faithful enough for her to have been deemed old faithful. Now, when we think about faithfulness, we know that men often fall short of standards of faithfulness. But God does not. One of the leading characteristics that the Bible gives us of God is that God is faithful. Consider some passages with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. I think it's interesting that in this book, which was written to a church that was anything but faithful, this statement is made of God. God's faithfulness really stands in contrast to their unfaithfulness. It says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9, God is faithful by whom ye were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What a great statement that is. God is faithful. You might want to go later to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. And again, we have these words, God is faithful. That is who He is at the very heart of His being. He is faithful. Paul says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to to bear it. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse twenty four. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse twenty four. Again, Paul would emphasize the faithfulness of God. He says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Hebrews chapter ten and verse twenty three. It's a great statement of God's faithfulness. Hebrews chapter ten and verse twenty three. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And 1 John 1 and verse 9. 1 John 1 and verse 9. Another great statement of God's faithfulness. We often quote it. It reads, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So these are just a sampling of the many passages that speak of the faithfulness of God. In fact, uh, we held out some of the ones that that stated in a little different way because we want to use those later on in the lesson and make the points of the lesson. But these verses alone suggest that God is faithful. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9, he is called the faithful God. In Revelation 19 and verse 11, His names are faithful and true. In Revelation 3 and verse 14, He is referred to as the faithful and true witness. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 19, He is a faithful creator. And in Isaiah 49 and verse 7, He is referred to as the Lord that is faithful. This is a characteristic of God. It is a characteristic that stands out. It is a characteristic to which we can cling on to and trust in the faithfulness of God. Now, I brought up all of this about the faithfulness of God because Psalm 89 has as its central theme the faithfulness of God. 
the fact that God is faithful. In fact, God's faithfulness is mentioned a number of times in this psalm. This is a rather long psalm. It has 52 verses in it, so we won't be able to go verse by verse as we sometimes do, but we will hit the highlights at least. And the major thrust of the psalm deals with God's faithfulness. Notice verse 1. He says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Notice the reference to God's faithfulness. Notice in verse 2. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. Verse 5. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Psalm 89 in verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who has a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee. Psalm 89 in verse 24, But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. And then in verse 33, of this psalm as well. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. See the references beginning throughout the psalm to the faithfulness of God. Now we'll understand why the psalmist was so concerned with that faithfulness as we move a little deeper into the psalm. Now we talked about last week that Psalm 88 is the saddest song in Israel's songbook. And really in that psalm, there is nothing to latch on to by way of encouragement or by way of hope. And so we might say that Psalm 88 ends with a sob. It ends with a cry. If that's the case, then Psalm 89 begins with a song. Notice he says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And so we've made a transition between the sadness associated with Psalm 88 to a song in Psalm 89, the singing, and and a more cheerful song. Even though this psalm contains that which is discouraging, and this psalm captures a time in Israel when things were not as they should have been. In fact, the psalmist has some great questions about whether or not God's going to keep His Word. Because at least at the moment, it doesn't look as if God's promises are coming to pass. And yet, woven through all of that is the fact that God is faithful. And the psalmist is able to sing of God's faithfulness, believing that God may yet keep His promises. Now, as we look at the outline of this psalm, we want to see three things about God's faithfulness. First of all, God is faithful and His pity will not fail. In the second place, God is faithful and His power will not fail. And finally, God is faithful and His promises will not fail. We want to begin with the pity of God in the first four verses. He says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known Thy faithfulness to all generations. Notice the connection between the mercies of the Lord and the faithfulness of God. In verse 2, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. Notice again the connection between mercy and faithfulness. It's a connection we'll make throughout the psalm. It says in verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen, and I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever, and build up thy throne to all generations. And then we have, say law, we have this pause. Stop and ponder that. Stop and think about that. But the point that the psalmist is clinging on to here is that God is faithful and His mercies are not going to fail. God's faithful and His pity is not going to fail. God's going to continue to be compassionate. He's going to continue to be merciful. He's going to continue to be long-suffering with His people. And even though things are not very good at the moment, the psalmist is trusting in the faithfulness of God. And the fact that this mercy and this pity and this Patience is a part of who God is. And God is going to be faithful to Himself. He's going to be faithful to His character. And so His mercy is going to continue to be enjoyed by them. Now, the connection between mercy and faithfulness can be seen throughout the psalm. Consider some other verses that connect it. Notice in verse 14, 
Justice and judgment are the habitations of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Notice mercy and truth. Mercy and, and, and what is right. Mercy and that which can be counted on. But notice that we go a little deeper and you'll see the connection even more clearly in verse 24. It says, But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Notice the connection. My faithfulness, my mercy, they go hand in hand. Notice verse 28. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Notice mercy and standing fast. Standing fa fast is faithfulness. We have this connection here. Now, the reason why I pointed all that out is because at the very heart of who God is, God is faithful. Now, that means that God is faithful in all of His attributes. However you might describe God, if you describe God as just, if you describe God as holy, if you describe God as love, if you describe God as long-suffering, and all of those things are said to be His attributes, then God is faithful in all of those attributes. Every one of those attributes of God can be counted on, and God will be found to be faithful in those attributes. He'll be found to be faithful in His patience. He'll be found to be faithful in His righteousness. There won't be any wavering in any of those areas. There won't be any deficiency or any letdown in any of those areas. God is faithful. And so in all of those areas, God will be true to who He is. He cannot deny Himself. And so when the Bible tells us that God is love, as 1 John 4 and verse 8 tells us that He is, then God will be faithful in His love. That's the case that we live in a world and we live with relationships, whether they be friends, whether they be even members of our own family sometimes, where the love is not faithful. The, the love is, is, is not true. Where they're deficient in some way in that attribute or in that characteristic. But God never is. God is faithful in His love. God's faithful in His pity. He's faithful in His mercy. And so I know that in my life, when I need mercy, and when I need pity, and when I need long-suffering, I can know that God will be faithful in that. I may not always be faithful in my love for Him, but He is always faithful in His love for me. I may waver in my love for Him. He doesn't waver in His love for me. His love for me is constant. His love for me is perfect, as it is for you, as it is for all of His children. You know, sometimes we, we, maybe when we were growing up, when we were children, we took a flower and we began to pick the petals off of that flower and say, He loves me, He loves me not. He loves me, He loves me not. Or she loves me, she loves me not. Whatever it may have been. Just kind of wavering back and forth. And always, how, how is it going to end up? What's the last petal going to say? But in our relationship with God, it isn't like that. In our relationship with God, it isn't. He loves me, He loves me not. He loves me, He loves me not. I don't get up one day and He loves me and get up the next day and He doesn't. Or I don't come to Him one minute and He loves me and the next minute He doesn't. It's not that kind of fickle, frail, human type of love. It isn't that way at all. No, it's literally, He loves me, He loves me, He loves me. He loves me. That's the way it is. There's the constancy to that. There, there's that faithfulness in that. And the psalmist is latching on to that and he says, God is faithful and His pity will not fail. I know that, that God's people stand in need of mercy and grace. And I know that because God is faithful, they will receive that mercy. They will receive that grace. He will not fail them. That's the confidence that he has. But in the second place, notice that God is faithful and His power will not fail. Now, there are a number of references to God's power beginning in verse 5, and it's connected with His faithfulness. Notice in verse 5, "...and the heavens shall praise Thy wonders, O Lord, Thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints." Notice we have God's wonders in verse 5. But we also have God's faithfulness. The Bible often talks about signs and wonders. 
That refers to God's power. It refers to the demonstration of God's power. And here we have the wonders connected with God's faithfulness. But notice verse 6. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Who can you find that's like the Lord when it comes to might or power? And the answer is no one. Notice in verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, to be had in reverence of all them that are about Him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto Thee, or to Thy faithfulness round about Thee? Literally, who is a strong God like You? Who is a faithful God like You? Who you can you compare to God in power? Who can you compare to God in faithfulness? Well, there's no comparison. There's no one else that matches up to God. And then, beginning in verse 9, we have a number of references, although sometimes veiled, to the power of God. Notice verse 9. Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. God, God has power over the sea. You remember that God demonstrated that power in the Old Testament, didn't He? On a number of occasions. He did with a parting, of course, of the Red Sea. He demonstrated the power that He has over the Jordan River with stopping that river from flowing so that His children could cross. He did that on another occasion when He made an axe head to swim, bringing a heavy piece of metal to the top surface of the water. God's able to control that. He demonstrated that in the Old Testament a number of times. He brought water forth out of a rock, right? God was able to do that. In the New Testament, we see Jesus' power over that, which should have said to those um, disciples who saw it, He's God. This is what God did in the Old Testament. God controlled the water in this way in the Old Testament, and here Jesus Christ is controlling the water in the same way. The great storm, peace be still. It was still. He was God. He demonstrated Himself to be God. But here's God's power over the, the waters. Now notice verse 10. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. Now we mentioned Rahab a week or so ago, and we, we said that Rahab was Egypt. That's what commentators generally say. I went back and did some looking at it. And if you'll trace Rahab and trace the verses that mention Rahab, there are verses that, especially in Isaiah, that, that seem to clearly point to the fact that Rahab is a veiled description of Egypt. And the, the parting of the Red Sea and the other things that are described in those passages clearly say Rahab has to be Egypt because that's the best application or best fulfillment of that term. And, and I thought, even in my own mind, we, we've studied in the Psalms already where sometimes the psalmist uses language that is unique. For example, the psalmist will speak of the tribe of Joseph. Well, if we go back and we, we start looking, we don't find the tribe of Joseph, do we? We find various tribes, but Joseph isn't one of the tribes. Ephraim and Manasseh, his two sons, were divided apart. They were, they were given his portion. So... But we don't. But Joseph is put for all of the tribes by the psalmist. Well, here Rahab appears to be put for Egypt. And and the more I thought about that and trying to come out to why that's the case, think about what happened when the children of Israel were leaving the wilderness wanderings. They were entering into the promised land. The very first place they came to was Jericho. You remember when the spies came in to spy out that land? Who hid those spies? Rahab did. And do you remember what Rahab said? We heard how that your God dried up the waters, right? Our hearts did melt when we heard that, she said. Our hearts melted when we heard of what your God did in delivering you from Egyptian bondage. I don't know if that's the reason why Rahab is put for Egypt here, but it's interesting at least to suggest that Rahab, in talking to the spies who were coming out of Egypt, talked about the power that God had shown over Egypt. And here is the power that God has shown over Rahab, over that country or over uh, that land. At least something to consider here. But notice as we continue. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces, 
We see that in even the parting of the Red Sea with the chariot wheels coming off and the great power and might of Egypt falling apart as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. If you remember, the next day, after the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea, what did they find washed up along the shoreline? Pharaoh and his host, right? Bodies scattered along the seashore of their enemies. Pictured here. Strong arm, that is used a a number of times in reference to God bringing them out of Egypt. God's arm was stronger than that of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was trying to hold on to them, but God's arm was stronger and God delivered them in spite of Pharaoh's attempts to hang on to them. And the word strong arm is used a number of times in reference to Egypt. It says in verse 11, The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. God is the Creator. He had the power of creation. Verse 12, The north and the south, thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon, which represents north and south, shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. The idea of high is thy right hand is the idea of being ready to strike. God's ready to deliver. God's ready to bring down His hand in power. All of these descriptions, mighty arms, strong hand, high right hand. 14, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy faith. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in their favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Then thou spakest in vision to the Holy One, and says, I have have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted the chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. Notice God says, my power is going to deliver my anointing. He talks about David here and beating down David's enemies. Go back sometime and just make a list of David's enemies. And then write one enemy that God didn't beat down. beat down every one of them. Everyone who ever rose up against David ended up on the losing end of that before it was over with, including Absalom. Everyone did. But this is a, this is a, a, a small picture of the seed of David. And really this psalm has a great deal to say about the seed of David, Christ who is to come, and the fact that He is God's anointed and His enemies, not a one of them that rise up against Him, will prevail over Him. You remember 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24, beginning, tells us that He shall put down all enemies. He's going to trample them underneath His feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But no enemy who ever rose up against Christ is victorious against Him. He ultimately gained the victory over them. God saw to it. So here's a parallel between David and the greater man, Jesus Christ and what God was going to do uh, through him. So here we have God's power being referred to again and again in this psalm. We've got to move on if we're going to get get done. I want to make reference to a couple of New Testament passages. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. The Apostle Paul talks about the faithfulness of God in connection with God's power says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. David says, or Paul says, as David had said, I'm persuaded, I'm confident, I'm convinced that God's going to be able to keep that which I've committed to him. God's going to be faithful. I've committed it to him. God's going to be faithful. He's able to do. He's able to do what I've committed to Him. He's not lacking in power. He has the power to perform what He said He would do. Go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. 
great illustration of the faithfulness of God and the power of God. And Abraham saw both. It's why Abraham is the father of the faithful. It's why he has the great reputation as being the friend of God, because he saw this about God. It says, as it is written in verse 17 of Romans 4, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. That's one of my favorite statements about God. God calleth things which be not as though they were. You know, I can talk about the things that have occurred in the past. But God can talk about the future as if it were the past. Because God sees the future in the same way that we can look back and see the past. God can look ahead and see the future. That's the God that we serve. Notice He says, do you remember what He said to Abraham? you remember how He said His descendants would be as the stars of heaven, as the sand on the seashore, as the dust of the earth? Here's God looking forward in the same way that we look back to see things, God looks into the future and God says, your seed are going to be like the stars of heaven. They're going to be like the sand of the seashore. They're going to be like the dust of the earth for number, for multitude. God was able to look forward and see that. Notice He says, who against hope believed in hope. That's Abraham. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. He against hope believed in hope. Didn't seem to be any reason for hope, but he believed in it anyway. Now, if there didn't seem to be any basis for hope, why did Abraham believe in hope? What was his basis for that? God is faithful. God said, I'm going to give you a son. God said your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore. Abraham didn't have any any reason from a human perspective to be able to see that coming to pass. Look at his age. Look at Sarah's condition. Look at her age. But Abraham trusted God because God said it. God's faithful. He trusted in that. Notice as we continue. It says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what He had promised, He was able also to perform. Abraham said, God said it, God will do it. Trusted in the faithfulness of God. Hebrews 11 and verse 11 says, Sarah did the same. The final point, God is faithful. His promises will not fail. The third section of this psalm deals clearly with God's promises. And as we begin looking... Rather than verse 19, I moved it up to verse 28. Verses 28 through 52. As we look at this, we have references to His law, to His judgments, to His statutes, to His commandments, and many references to His covenant. Now what this has to do with is what God has said, what God has promised. And again, we have this connection being made in this last section of Psalm 89 between what God has promised and what God will do with God's faithfulness. Now, I don't have time to notice everything I want to, but I want you to take a look at the way that the psalmist feels about things. Things things are not good. And so the psalmist looks at the circumstances, and, and the psalmist says, God must have voided His covenant. God, God must have decided He's not going to fulfill His promises. Because on the surface, that's what it looked like. Notice he says, beginning in verse 38, But thou hast cast off and abhorred, thou hast been wroth with thine anointed, thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant, thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground, thou hast broken down all his hedges, thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin, all that pass by the way spoil him, he is a reproach to his neighbors. Thou hast set up the right hand of his adversaries. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. Thou hast also turned the edge of his sword and hast not made him to stand in the battle. Thou hast made his glory to cease and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth hast thou shortened. Thou hast covered him with shame. And notice again as we move down the context, verse 49. Lord, where are thy former loving kindnesses? which thou swearest unto David in thy truth. Notice what he says. He says, God, your pity 
you showed so often to David, it seems to be failing. God, your power in holding us up and defending us and helping us in battle, it seems to be failing. God, it seems as if your promises are failing. It seems as if they're not coming to pass. Now, based from a human perspective, that's what things look like. But notice how the psalm ends, verse 52. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Now, there's some question as to whether or not this verse is a part of this psalm or whether or not this verse was something that finished out this third book. Either way, this is where it is. This is where it's found. And this third book, this last psalm, ends with a blessing for who God is. And so the idea is, God, I don't see how you're going to do it. God, it looks as if all is lost. But I know You're faithful. And I know that Your pity, I know that Your power, and I know that Your promises will not fail. And even though from a human perspective I can't see the way, I will trust in Your faithfulness. I want to suggest to you tonight that God is faithful. In fact, if you think about Old Faithful, the geyser that we started with, how old is it in comparison to God? Not very old, is it? God's eternal. That's only been here since God created the world, and it may not have even been here until after the flood and the way that the world was remade following the flood. I don't know how long that geyser's been here, but I know that God had no beginning. God's far older. That geyser is fairly faithful. People go to see it, and within ten minutes or so, you can see it erupt when they say it will. That's some kind of faithfulness, but it isn't anything in comparison to the faithfulness that we're talking about God. God's faithfulness isn't just within a certain ballpark of time. God's faithfulness is without time. God's faithfulness is, is without measure. Oh, how amazing it is and how comforting it is to know that God is faithful. Thank you for your attention tonight.